for the kind invitation and the much too flattering introduction. I would have loved to join you on grass, of course, but uh, online is better than nothing. And I think we must adapt in scientific discourse as well to the new normal. And I'm really happy to participate in this great project and to share with you my, my thoughts on the future development of international criminal law. Uh, let me start with a kind of disclaimer and a short overview on my personal research background. I am a professor of criminal law who does not really believe in criminal law or only to a very limited extent. The idea that punishing people for harmful conduct can deter and prevent future crime seems persuasive, but for all we know, it, it simply doesn't work, mainly because people do not really accept that their involvement in crime becomes public and that they indeed have to face criminal prosecutions and sanctions. Moreover, criminal prosecutions are highly selective and probably discriminatory. In this way, criminal law has also been described as a measure to control and discipline the lower class and marginalized groups. These, let's call it dark sides of criminal law, are all the more concerning, given that the infliction of criminal punishment is the severest intrusion into citizens' rights available to a state bound by the rule of law. Against this background, I am, as a matter of principle, uh, critical on um, expansions of criminal law. In fact, overcriminalization, that is the unjustified or disproportional use of criminal law, is a constant but often underestimated threat to liberty and human rights. Despite all these shorts coming, however, I do believe that at least in case of violations of individual rights, criminal law can have a certain positive communicated function as a criminal conviction contains a clear condemnation of the behavior in question, marks it as legal wrong, acknowledges the suffering of victims, and can assist in restoring public peace and public confidence in the integrity of the legal order. This however presupposes that criminal law is applied and enforced in a, an efficient, meaningful and predictable way. And in my presentation, I would like to show that in international criminal law, we have both a risk of overcriminalization and a risk of non-enforcement. In doing so, I will focus on three areas the prescriptive criminal jurisdiction of states, European criminal law, and the international criminal justice system, strict sensu. It is meanwhile commonly accepted that the competence to establish criminal jurisdiction is limited by international law. Roughly speaking, states may prosecute crimes committed abroad only if they have a legitimate interest to do so. And this presupposes the existence of a real link or a genuine connection between the case at hand and the state claiming jurisdiction. Otherwise, the establishment or exercise of exterritorial jurisdiction violates the principle of non-intervention and unduly restricts the defendant's freedom of action. Despite this, we have witnesses in the last years an increased tendency to apply national criminal law across borders. Just one example. After the implementation of the Convention of the Council of Europe, on preventing and combating violence against women and domestic violence, the so-called Istanbul Convention. German criminal law allows since uh, 2017 for the prosecution of forced marriages, even if committed abroad, provided 
that the act is directed against a person who has a domicile or usual residence in Germany. Don't get me wrong, I'm not fond of forced marriages. Nevertheless, this exterritorial approach is not unproblematic. Imagine that I'm uh, an Afghan national living in Germany for um, 10 years, takes a 16 year old daughter who's also an Afghan national to a uh, holiday trip to Afghanistan where she introduces D to the 20 year old P and demands from her daughter to marry P right on the spot. Otherwise, she would disown D and return to Germany without her. D is scared and agrees to marry P. Supposing that this behavior is not criminal under Afghan law, it seems questionable if Germany really has the right to bring in other foreign norms as a kind of external evaluation standard. The German legislator deemed this necessary in order to avoid that the criminal prohibition of forced marriages, which also aims to protect German residents, is undermined by such holiday marriages. This is understandable, but nevertheless conflicts with the sovereign right of, Afga of Afghanistan, who is forced to tolerate the exercise of foreign jurisdiction and thus the exercise of foreign state power with regard to a predominantly domestic incident. Germany thus arguably undermines Afghanistan's sovereign decision not to criminalize forced marriages and at the same time prevents M um, from exercising her freedom to act in line with the law of the territorial state. And I predict that in the next years to come, states will continue to broaden the territorial scope of the criminal law and use it as a tool of the transnational export and transnational enforcement of national values, in particular with regard to the cyberspace. This carries with it the risk of overcriminalization and conflicts of jurisdiction, which in turn may reduce the predictability of criminal law and lead to legal uncertainty. On the European level, criminal law has long been regarded as a purely national matter, which is not, or at least only to a very limited extent, the union law. This has changed at the very latest with the Lisbon Treaty, which grants the EU broad competencies to harmonize national criminal law um, by way of directives. The European Union has made broad use of these competencies and issued inter alia um, norms for defining crimes in the areas of child pornography, cybercrime, market abuse, fraud against the union's financial interest, and so on. These measures, however, are not based on a coherent overall criminal uh, policy that specifies what conduct deserves punishment and which interest or goods are worth of criminal protection. Rather, the union tends to use criminal law as a normal regulatory tool uh, to combat socially unwanted behavior. This ignores that due to its significant impact on fundamental rights, criminal law is the last resort of social control. And due to its invasive character, the legitimacy of criminal law also depends on its coherence. If, for example, active corruption is defined more broadly in the anti fraud directive than in the anti corruption protocol, this endangers the understandability and acceptability of the criminal justice system. More worrisome, however, is the union's focus on the efficiency of the law enforcement. At a time when crimes are often committed across borders, States increasingly depend on mutual support, in the gathering of evidence, and the arrest of suspects. Based on the principle of mutual recognition, the EU has created a unique system of international cooperation, which basically presupposes that a judicial decision rendered in one member state must automatically be accepted and enforced in our, every other member state. This mutual recognition is, 
fully implemented, very effective, as it allows for a kind of free movement of judicial decision and an unhampered cross-border enforcement of criminal law. It can be seen as a counterpart to the freedom of movement, which is prone to misuse. The still open and, question, uh, and pressing question, however, is how to safeguard the rights of the suspect in transnational criminal proceeding. The European Union has enacted several directives to harmonize fair trial rights, but these merely confirm certain minimum standards, which are arguably not sufficient compensation for the increase in police and prosecutorial powers. As so it's all the more true if one looks at the institutionalization of European criminal law. Europol maintains a comprehensive information system, which includes a wealth of personal data and supports the member states in the gathering and analysis of intelligence. Eurojust supports and improves judicial cooperation in cross-border cases as a kind of documentation and service center, and the newly created not yet operable, European public prosecutor even has the power to indict person for crimes against the financial interest against the union of the union before national courts. The main challenge for the future development of European criminal law, this will be the protection of individual rights in internationalized proceedings and the installation of a European defense as a counterpart to the U European Law Enforcement Agency. And we will see how the Union will deal with that. Let me now turn to the international criminal justice system created for the universal prosecution of the international core crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. When the statute of the International Criminal Court was adopted in 1998, and entered into the forest in 2002. This new institution was met with great enthusiasm. International criminal tribunals were believed to bring justice to those responsible for serious violations of human rights and humanitarian law, to put an end to such violations and prevent their recurrence, to secure justice and dignity for victims, establish a record of past events, promote rational, national reconciliation, re-establish the rule of law, and contribute to the restoration of peace. Given this high expectation, the International Criminal Court was probably kind of doomed to disappoint. In almost 20 years of operation, the ICC has only produced seven final judgments. Four persons were convicted for war crimes and crimes against humanity, and this cases still concern the ICC as they are still in the reparation phase. Four persons were acquitted. In two cases, the pre-trial chamber declined to confirm the charges against the defendant. In one case, the prosecutor has to withdraw uh, the charges due to insufficient evidence. And another case was terminated in the trial stage because the trial chamber found that there was no case to answer for the defendant for the defense, that is, the prosecution had not presented sufficient evidence on which a reasonable trial chamber could convict the accused. Naturally, the efficiency of a criminal justice system cannot and must not be judged by the court's output and even less by its conviction rate. Acquittals and termination of proceedings are an integral part of a fair trial system with respect to the fundamental rights of the suspect. At least some of these decisions, however, reveal general problems and deficits of the international criminal justice system. The international criminal court and its procedural law is a mixture mainly from elements of the common law and the civil law tradition. The practical application of this system so generous is a high challenge to the actors trained in and influenced by the respective national legal systems. And the separate opinion on the acquittal of Don Kier Bembo, judges von den Windengard and Morrison quite frankly described this, let's call it clash of culture, and its effect on the daily work of the court as follows. 
it's important to recognize that the strong divergence in how we, the judges of the appeals chamber, evaluate the conviction decision is not just a matter of difference of opinion, but appears to be a fundamental difference in the way we look at our mandates as international judges. We seem to start from different premises, both in terms of how the law should be interpreted and applied, and in terms of how we conceive of, of our role as judges. This seems a little disturbing as it indicates that after, at the time of the decision, 15 years, the ICC has neither developed a common understanding of the basis premises of its work and the general principles it is based upon, nor developed a common self-concept. This, on the one hand, may lead to divergent decision, which in turn can violate the principle of equality before the law. And on the other hand, internal discrepancies and safe insecurities may make a court particularly vulnerable for political pressure. This became obvious, for example, in the um, situation in Afghanistan. In the meanwhile, notorious decision, the pre-trial chamber denied the prosecutor's request for opening a proprio motor investigation in Afghanistan. Although the chamber agreed that there were reasonable grounds to believe that crimes falling within the jurisdiction of the court had been committed, not only by the Taliban, but also by US military forces and the CIA, it concluded that international criminal proceedings would not serve the interest of justice. As the preliminary investigations in Afghanistan had been particularly long and difficult, the chamber assumed that prosecution were unlikely to succeed and thus run the risk to frustrate the hopes of the victims raised by the investigations. This decision was obviously influenced by power politics. When assessing the prospect of future action by the court, the chamber referred to the scare cooperation obtained by the prosecution and noted that subsequent changes within the relevant political landscape, both in Afghanistan and case uh, states, make it extremely difficult to gauge the prospect of securing meaningful cooperation from relevant authorities for the future but then respect of the investigation or surrender of suspect. The impression of political dependency is stringent by the delicate timing. The pre-trial chamber rendered the decision shortly after the United States had once again threatened the ICC with sanctions if it started prosecuting US nationals and had revoked the visa of the then chief prosecutor. Meanwhile, the decision was squashed on appeal. The appeal chamber dealt predominantly with the delicate relationship between prosecutorial independence and judicial supervision, but also stated of the dictator that the pre-trial chamber's reasoning was speculative and did not refer to information capable of supporting it. This clear commitment to the mandate of the ICC and the idea that justice must be put beyond politics, however, cannot hide the fact that the enforcement of international criminal law is hampered by political interference and the lack of will of some states to cooperate with the ICC. And it's no case to answer decision, for example, the judge stated that the investigations and the ability of the prosecution to produce reliable and compelling evidence was seriously affected by a disturbing level of interference with witnesses, as well as inappropriate attempts at the political level to matter with the trial and to affect its outcome. The issue of arrest warrants against the then head of Sudan, Osama al-Bashir, caused a political backlash. Um, several state parties refused to arrest and surrender al-Bashir, which constituted, at least in the view of the ICC, a breach of the cooperation obligations. And in reaction to the ICC's non-compliance decision, African states adopted a strategy for mass withdrawal from the Rome Institute. To cut a long story short, the ICC is under political pressure and struggles with itself, its mandate, and its role in the international criminal justice system. Therefore, one, one may easily predict that in the next 10 years, the ICC 
we continue to conduct a few more or less symbolic trials without really making a difference. But, and here I'm becoming more optimistic, one, man, one must not underestimate the symbolic value of the ICC. First of all, the ICC statute contains the clear message that the Commission of the International Court of Crimes, including the highly political crime of aggression, constitutes criminal wrong and is thus subject to judicial evaluation. Thus, by its very existence, the ICC contributes to the depolitization of international law. That this is not without effect can be seen if one looks at the pre-investigation stage. Amongst others, the prosecutor has dealt with various forms of abuses allegedly committed by members of British forces against Iraqi civilians, including murder, torture, and rape. In December 2020, the prosecutor closed the pre-investigations, but not without providing a detailed and critical assessment of the UK attempts to bring to justice those responsible for the alleged crimes. In other words, a strong Western government had to explain and justify its prosecutorial strategy before an international body. And I think that is more than we have recently hoped for 20 years ago. And besides this a supervisory or disciplinary function, the SEC has a catalytic effect on the national enforcement of international criminal law. As many other countries, Germany has implemented the ICC core crimes into national law and even allows for a universal prosecution of genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes. And meanwhile, the German prosecutor really plays an active role in the international fight against impunity. Apart from monitoring the activities of the German Bundeswehr, one focus of the federal prosecutor lies on the prosecution of so-called foreign fighters who traveled from conflict to, who traveled to conflict areas like Syria and then later returned to Germany. He also indicted uh, persons in the context of the Jazidian genocide and former members of the Assad regimes for torture as a crime against humanity, the Copeland's trial, which is followed very closely by the world press. Similar proceedings take place in other countries. And the national prosecution of international crime is not without challenges and risk. The reconstruction of events that happened thousands of kilometers away from the court is difficult. The gathering and assessment of evidence is hampered by cultural and linguistic barriers, and the court is faced with information needs of the foreign society. And arguably, the national procedural laws need some updates in order to guarantee a fair and efficient prosecution of international crimes. But this is the future. In the next decades to come, we will witness an increase in the decentral national enforcement of international law, and this proceeding will make a significant contribution to the fight against impunity for international crime and the global protection of human rights law. And with this optimistic outlook, I would like to conclude. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.